From the Midnight at the Dragon Cafe, Judy Fong Bates. This excerpt is from a novel about Su Jin, a girl who travels with her mother from China to Ontario, a small province of Canada. She is meeting her father for the first time. He left his family to emigrate alone to the small Ontario town of Irvine to be the proprietor of a Chinese restaurant. In this scene, Su Jen and her mother say goodbye to relatives in Toronto, Canada and travel to Irvine. Before leaving Toronto on the train to Irvine, my mother changed back into her dark green suit. She gave Uncle John, oh, she gave Uncle John, excuse me. She gave Uncle John and Aunt Hailan a package of ginseng and set a set of ivory mahjong tiles. Lai Jing and Aunt Hailan had her in a pleading voice, said to her in a pleading voice, you must not think so much about China. We couldn't have stayed. China is no longer the country we knew. Life here really is better. You must concentrate on Su Jen. Give yourself some time and soon things will improve. Now come and visit. Don't spend all your time hiding in the small town. Smiling with her lips together and a sad look in her eyes, my mother nodded and said, I have to visit. You have the mahjong set. They both laughed and Aunt Hailan hugged her goodbye. During the trip, mother remained pensive. She was absorbed in her own world and barely spoke to me. I watched her play with the top button of her coat and thought about the man I was about to meet, my father, whose face I knew only from a small black and white photograph. At last, my mother pulled me close to her and I nestled in her softness and warmth. I started to fall asleep, feeling her finger lightly circle the whirl of my ear. My mother had shown the conductor a white envelope on which Uncle Jong had written the name of our town. When we left Toronto, the sun was low on the horizon and the city's buildings had towered into the sky. But when we arrived in Irvine, it seemed the empty darkness would swallow us. My mother remarked to herself how quickly the day had become night. The conductor gestured to us in a brusque manner, eager to get us moving, and pointed at the door. My mother and I followed behind, hesitating at the steps. He took our suitcases off the train and placed them on the long platform that ran in front of a low-roofed wooden building. Then, in an apparent change of manner, he scooped me up and carried me down from the train. I started to laugh, but I stopped when I saw the anxious look on my mother's face. In the dim light of the overhang, I saw an old man running toward us, his woolen peak cap pulled over his forehead, his brown loose-fitting coat flopping up and down with each step. He stopped as he drew near, huffing out of breath. I noticed how the sleeve of the coat covered his hands. He touched my mother lightly on one arm and spoke in our dialect. Lai Jing, you are here at last. Yes, Hing Wun, we are here, she said, nodding, holding his gaze for a moment. This is Su Jen. Gently easing me from her side, she looked down at me. Su Jen, this is your Baba. My father knelt down and lifted me into his arms. I peeked over his shoulder and saw my mother staring at us, her face without expression, her eyes wet with tears. I looked up and saw stars against a dark, deep sky. Small puffs of mist escaped my mouth. With his hands against my head, my father gently pressed my face against his shoulder. I felt the rough texture of wool chafing my cheek and breathed in the faint scent of cooking oil. This memory has remained as crisp as the air in the night. Over time, my life in Hong Kong and in our village in China became distant, almost forgotten, with only flashes of clarity rare memories of sleeping on a straw mat in the humid summer, or watching my mother close, close the wrought iron accordion gates in front of our home. 
My father carried our suitcases and we followed him into the empty street to a taxi parked in front of the station. The light from the street lamps reflected off the snow. Everything around us was still and quiet. One, Mahjong, a Chinese game played with rectangular tiles bearing various designs. Question number 20. In paragraph two, the author uses dialogue to A, communicate critical aspects of the setting, B, introduce the fears of the main character, C, introduce a conflict between characters, D, add some humor to a serious situation. Question 21. Read this sentence from paragraph three. I watched her play with the top button of her coat and thought about the man was at, I was about to meet, my father, whose face I knew only from a small black and white photograph. This sentence conveys Sue Jen's feeling of A, uncertainty, B, despair, C, irritation, D, disapproval. Question 22. In paragraph three, pensive means A, polite, B, attentive, C, reassured, D, contemplative. Number 23. Read this sentence from paragraph five. He stopped as he drew near puffing and out of breath. This sentence contains an example of a simile, that's A, B, a metaphor, C, onomatopoeia, D, irony. Question 24. The character of Su Jin is mainly revealed through her A, actions, B, dialogue, C, appearance, D, thoughts. Question 25. Based on the selection, Su Jin's father may be best described as A, carefree, B, Determined, C, confident, D, affectionate. Question 26. Later chapters of this selection would most likely describe A, Su Jen's adjustment to her new home, B, the reunions of other Chinese immigrants, C, Su Jen's life in a small Chinese village. D, the construction of a new restaurant. Do you have that next section? Okay. Question 27. You do not need to read the passage to answer this question. Which word carries a negative connotation in this sentence? Patrick's mother is assuming that when her son refrains from fraternizing so much, he will become more accomplished. A, mother. B, assuming. C, refrains. D, fraternizing. E, accomplished. Question 28. Read this sentence. Ryan was meticulous with his writing assignments, so the paper he turned in for English class received the highest grades for grammar because they never contained mistakes. As used in this sentence, the word meticulous means a notably interested and insightful, B, 
especially careful about details. C, overly cautious of possible consequences. D, exceptionally rational and reasonable. Question 29. Which fact from a magazine article would be best included in a report about the literary career of William Faulkner? A. By the time Faulkner entered eighth grade in 1911, he had begun to show signs of increasing truancy. B. Faulkner worked briefly as a clerk at the First National Bank, which was owned by his grandfather. C. Shortly after entering the University of Mississippi, Faulkner won a $10 prize offered by Professor Calvin S. Brown. D. In 1921, Faulkner accepted a job as postmaster at the University of Mississippi Post Office. Question number 30. The days following tryouts, oh, read these sentences, excuse me. The days following tryouts for the wrestling team were a roller coaster ride for Ian. He had done his best at the tryouts and hoped the coaches would want him to wrestle on the varsity team. He worried over it for hours. The purpose of the figurative language in these sentences is, suggest, is to suggest that Ian A regretted how he had performed, B, alternately felt optimistic and pessimistic, C, desperately wanted to be on the varsity team, D, waited a long time to learn the results of the tryouts. And that is the end.